Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour. My name is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor at Clavel Assembly in Foster, Rhode Island, who brings to you this YouTube channel, and we welcome you to the YouTube channel. And uh, we're glad to have you. Invite your friends. Send them links. Tell them about what we're talking about. We're talking about the Song of Moses. Back to the subject of the Song of Moses. I came back from vacation. I had to blow off a little steam because of the news I had to listen to when I was on vacation. Bothering me. But now we can get back to the Song of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 32. So we're very at a very pivotal point in the Song of Moses. But I think I just want to kind of recap and bring up the whole situation right up to where we left off. Because we left off at Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35. But I want to kind of summarize, summarize in a very brief way uh, today. I just kind of get us back in the groove of what we're dealing with in verse 35. Because we're talking about the Lord taking vengeance against his enemies who murdered the prophets. This is a huge deal when studying Deuteronomy 32. And it, eventually, you'll see, it demands of us a belief in the return of Jesus Christ in judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD, 2,000 years ago. Yep. Because the last days were 2,000 years ago. They're not in our future. They were 2,000 years ago. So let, let's back up here for a moment to Deuteronomy 31, and uh, we'll start at verse uh, 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? That's what they'll say. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods, and serve them, and provoke me, and break my covenant. Now look, in chapter 32, God gives Moses a song to teach the children of Israel. And they're going to sing about their future rebellion and the wrath that God will pour out on them because of their rebellion and their defection from him and their judgment because they broke the covenant. They're going to sing about their sin and God's wrath and cutting them off. That's what we're dealing with. Now, when, so when is this happening? I mean, in the dispensationalist mind, when does this happen? In the, in the futurist mind of any stripe of eschatology, when is this happening? People say, well, at the future second coming of Christ. Oh, okay, so at the future second coming of Christ, he's going to destroy Jerusalem. And judge them for their sin. Is that what dispensationalists believe? No, 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 they don't. They don't want to hear any of that. This is not talking about a future second coming of Christ, future to us. 
it was future to when Moses wrote this, but it's in our past. It was fulfilled in the first century at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now, I'm going to show you all that. And that's going to demand of us an understanding of the parousia return of Jesus Christ having necessarily to have taken place in the first century at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, according to the Bible. So let's back up and consider this a little bit more here, because we're laying a foundation here, chapter 31, verse 16 again. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. So Moses is old at this point. And if days left on earth are few, and he's going to sleep with his fathers. And once he sleeps with his fathers, well, things are going to go south. And this people, after he sleeps with his fathers, will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant. They will break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then, when they do that, my anger will be kindled against them in that day. It's the day of the Lord's wrath on Israel, on Jerusalem. And I will forsake them. And I will hide my face from them. Now, let's just stop here for a moment. So when is this talking about? It's either going to be when they went into Babylonian captivity at the judgment of Jerusalem in 70 AD or the future, a future, a so-called future second coming of Christ still in our future. It's going to be one of those. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to find out by looking at Deuteronomy 31 and 32, it is not a, it's not in our future. And it's not talking about going into Babylonian captivity. It's talking about when the whole old covenant system came to a crashing end with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the annihilation of the genealogical records by the Romans, the Jews don't know their genealogies anymore. There is no more tribe of Benjamin, of Asher, of Judah. There are no Levites running around. Those records were destroyed 2,000 years ago. It's part of history. The whole Old Covenant order ended in 70 AD. The world of God's election, as it existed, came to an end. Now, that doesn't mean God broke his promise to Abraham. Oh, no. He would, according to the prophets, kill Old Covenant Israel destroy them and put them to death. And then he would raise them from the dead and make a new covenant with them. That's the new covenant in Christ's blood made 2,000 years ago, coming to full fruition and application at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, legally coming to pass through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's hand in a glove material. But um, you, it, may, it might not strike you that way yet, but you can kind of see the structure of it, which sh could be that, but wait a minute, there's too many problems. Well, we'll talk about those. There's no problems. This is what the Bible teaches. So, okay. So, Moses is teaching them about a song. They're going to sing this song, and they're going to sing about their future rebellion where God cuts them off and destroys them because they broke the old covenant. And he's going to have to make a brand new covenant with him. This is what's going on here. He said, I, uh, I, he said, um, but the Lord said unto Moses, behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to among them, uh, go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant. The old covenant which I made with them. Then, once they've killed the prophets, 
and finally filled up the measure of their sin and murdered Christ, the whole Old Covenant order would be destroyed in judgment on Jerusalem. You can't practice Judaism today. It's impossible. Well, I know, there's synagogues all over the place. They're playing make-believe. There's no Levites. There's no sacrifice of animals. There's no temple. There's no altar. There's no means for forgiveness under the Old Covenant. They can't do it. You can't practice Judaism today. That's divine sovereignty. Moses is predicting that day here by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day when they break the everlasting covenant. You know, in Isaiah 24... I haven't gone through Isaiah with you. (laughs) Oh, boy. In Isaiah 24, the prophet talks about this. Isaiah 24, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste. He turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Hey, that sounds like the end of the universe. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? That's apocalyptic, metaphoric language when he describes the destruction of the universe. Is he talking about the material universe literally being destroyed? No. It's hyperbolic, metaphoric language. We've done a series series on that here on YouTube. Behold, the Lord Lord would come, Jehovah would come to judge his enemies, and it's always involving the universe being destroyed. Well, how many times have the universe been destroyed since creation? The physical universe. Well, never. Come on now. Got to get with the program. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests. As with the servant, so with the master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied. And utterly spoiled. Talking about Israel. For the Lord hath spoken this word. The earth mourneth. And fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. Now, the earth representing in metaphoric language Old Covenant Israel, Jerusalem. We've talked about that, how the heavens and earth are used metaphorically. The old heavens and earth I use metaphorically for old covenant Israel. So he says the land will be utterly emptied. Well, just the land, the land of Israel. But then he ch- switches his nomenclature and says the earth. Well, it's the metaphoric earth. Yes, the land of Israel, the environs around Jerusalem. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws The inhabitants of the earth have transgressed the laws. What laws? The law of God. Well, was the Mosaic law given to the Gentiles? No. It was given to Old Covenant Israel. They're the inhabitants of the earth. The old heavens and earth. The world of God's covenant relation. The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they, the inhabitants of the earth, quote-unquote, have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, the ordinance of God, broken the everlasting covenant. Well, with whom did God make the everlasting covenant? 
with the whole world, the literal globe of all nations and all people? No. The everlasting covenant God made with Old Covenant Israel. It wasn't the world that broke the everlasting covenant. It was the children of Israel that broke the everlasting covenant that God made with them. He didn't make it with the Gentiles. You know, how far do I go with this? There's so many fingers to this. I'm not sure how far to go afield. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 17... In verse 1 to 7. And when Abraham and with Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, Abraham, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. There's a lot to all that, but I'm not going to get into that now. And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and I'll make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, Abraham. And I'll establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, Abraham's seed, the children of Israel. The everlasting covenant was made with Abraham and his seed, not with all the nations of the physical world, all the Gentiles. You see, it's right there in Genesis 17. Look at verse 7. Read verses 1 to 7. The everlasting covenant was made with Old Covenant Israel. Now, in Isaiah 24, in verse 5, it says, The earth also is defiled under, under the inhabitants thereof, because they, the inhabitants of the metaphoric earth, of God's covenant relation, because they, the inhabitants of the earth, have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Isaiah 24 is about Israel breaking the old covenant law to the point where God has to cast them off. Isaiah 24 is about the exact same thing that Deuteronomy 32 is about. That was my time. Okay. So Isaiah 24, verse 5. The children of Israel broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, verse 6, hath the curse devoured the earth, <laughs> and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Who is guilty of breaking the everlasting covenant? And by the way, the evidence... In Isaiah 24, oh, you know, we could go through all of Isaiah 24. This, without question, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD at the termination of the Old Covenant order with the destruction of Jerusalem, which brought about the New Covenant in Christ's blood that he would make with the true Israel of God that believed on Christ, the true remnant from Abraham, 5,000 Jews saved, 3,000 Jews saved in the day of Pentecost. Israel being resurrected. Uh, a, a chapter or two later, 5,000 Jews come to receive Christ as their Savior. The foundation of the church, the New Testament church, quote-unquote, was all Jewish. God, the gospel went to the Jew first. He's keeping his promise to Abraham, to Israel, but he's going to make a new covenant. This is all the transaction that took place between the old and new covenant 2,000 years ago. And Isaiah 24 is about it. I don't have the time to go through that whole chapter. Boy, that'll be a doozy when we do. But that's what would be spoken of in Genesis 17. And verse 14, In the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. God made the covenant, the everlasting covenant of verse 7 of Genesis 17, was made with Israel. Now let's go back 
I'm trying to give you too many fingers, maybe, but write these down and study them. Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy 31, verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of their strangers, the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Israel will break the everlasting covenant. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. When they do that, and I, and by the way, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back is the murder of Christ. And his disciples that they also assaulted and ultimately would kill. Some of them dying at the hand of the beast under Rome. All in that first century generation, brethren. <laughs> you can't get by it. Boy, that day, the day when they break the everlasting covenant and God cuts them off. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them. I'll hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? Josephus, the Jewish historian who recorded the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies in 70 AD because he was there. He says this is because we've sinned. He's acknowledging what verse 17 is saying here in Deuteronomy 31. You've an unconverted Jew. And I'll surely hide my face in that day from all, for all the evils they shall have wrought in that they are turned unto other gods. And jumping down to verse 20, For when I shall have br brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves, and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods, and serve them, and provoke me, and break my covenant. And all this is going to happen when? We go to the end of the chapter. It's going to happen in the last days. That's right. Chapter 31, verse 29, Moses says, For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. Because Moses is delivering this, but it's the word of God. So God is saying this to them because Moses is delivering it to them. For I know that after my death, Moses says, ye will utterly corrupt yourself and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, because the commandment Moses gave to them came from the Lord. And evil will befall you in the latter days. Now, if the last days are in our future, and usher in the return of Christ in our future, then the Lord's going to destroy Jerusalem at his return, not save it. But you see, this isn't talking about something in our future. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Now that's the end of chapter 31. The next sentence is verse 1 of chapter 32. And now he, Moses is teaching them the song that they will sing as a discipline to warn them, you're going to turn from me, you're going to disobey me, and in the latter days I will judge and destroy you. And they have to learn that song and sing it as a discipline. And, and obviously the point would be so that they wouldn't make these mistakes. But they did. They're not mistakes. They're, it's sin, really. So now Moses addresses Israel. And how does he address them? Verse 1, give ear, 
O ye heavens! And I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Who is Moses speaking to? Old Covenant Israel. And he acts like he's talking to the heavens and the earth. Well, yeah, remember in Isaiah 51? <laughs> well, I won't go there, but Isaiah 51. Uh, Isaiah 51, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said, I took you out of Egyptian bondage. I caused you to cross the Red Sea. I gave you my law and put my words into your mouth. Why was he doing that? To, he's going, to make them a covenant nation, his nation proper. He delivered them from Egyptian bondage, brought them through the Red Sea, gave them his word, put his words in their mouth, the law, which they're to speak to their children when they rise up and when they lie down, when they walk by the way. And the Lord says in, in Isaiah 51, verse 15 and 16, and I was doing this, the re what I was doing when I did all this is I was laying the foundations of the heavens and the earth. I was creating the heavens and the earth and making you my people. Go read it in Isaiah 51, 15 to 16. We've covered that before. They're referred to as the heavens and earth, just like here. It's the world and the universe of God's covenant election. Verse 4, he is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. Who's Moses speaking of? Israel. That's what this song's about. When I die... You're going to corrupt yourself, and you're going to go to a certain point in your sins where God is going to ultimately come and destroy you in the latter days. They have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. That's why Jesus said, the Jews said, we, we be Abraham's children. And Jesus said, well, if you were Abraham's children, you wouldn't seek to kill me. You say you're Abraham's children, but you seek to kill me. This did not Abraham, Jesus said. Jesus is saying, you don't have Abraham as your father. Oh, I know Abraham's your father genealogically. But there in John 8, Jesus is saying, but you don't have Abraham as your father. You are of your father, the devil. That's what Jesus said. And here in Deuteronomy 32, 5, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They don't have Abraham as their father. They're not the children of God. They're the children of the devil. And they're working against God. They become antichrist. They are a perverse and crooked generation. And in the earlier editions of going through Deuteronomy 32, I covered that verse with some detail. And we see... Wait a minute. So in the last days, when Israel breaks the everlasting covenant and God cuts them off, finally and forever, in that generation, they are described as a perverse and crooked generation. Well, Jesus said that the generation he was living in, that that generation of Judaism was the perverse and crooked generation. And we repeated that through multiple places in the New Testament where the Lord clearly identified that generation to which he was ministering as being the one referred to in Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. Just go back and watch the previous installments in this series. You'll, you'll get that in detail. I'm not going to do that now. And jumping down to verse 15 of my time here. Oh, my time's up. They, esteem the, they don't esteem the rock of their foundation, verse 20. And he said, I'll hide my face from them, and I'll see their, what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Go read Matthew 17, 17. That was the generation Jesus ministered to. He's going to see what their end shall be. Their end. The old covenant order was coming to an end. When did that happen? In 70 AD, at the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple was leveled. The last vestiges of the old covenant were being done away. 
2,000 years ago. In the last days. Not the last days of the physical universe, the last days of the world and the universe of God's covenant relationship with Israel as his theocracy. Verse 29, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. And by the way, in verse 22, he says, for a fire shall is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with their increase. Now we have fire and brimstone and the set on fire, the foundation of the mountains. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem at the end of the old covenant age when they break the everlasting covenant. And now they've murdered the prophets, and finally they murder Christ. Jesus said, Jesus said to them, fill up the measure of your wrath. And then he said, this generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And then, in verse 35, to me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. The day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. So, next time we come here, we're going to talk about verse 35, the days of vengeance. When the Lord judges Jerusalem and destroys them and makes a new, brand new covenant with Israel, which he did through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and it was formalized and reached its consummation at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD at the Parousia coming of Christ, exactly when Jesus said he would come in that generation, before all those who were before him would die. Look, Moses is agreeing with Jesus. If you want to disagree with Moses and Jesus, you got to go do your own thing, because I'm not following that. I don't mean to be harsh with you. I'm speaking in strong terms to kind of force you to pay attention. And look, I am I was just like most of you. I didn't see these things before, and then I did. And I had to humble myself and say, you know what? I have not understood that correctly before. And I'm going to agree with Moses, and I'm going to agree with Jesus. And I hope you can too. But look, I'm out of time. My time's up. I've got to go. Let me thank you for watching. Do invite your friends. I mean well, despite my um, excitability. Jim Gallagher reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free.